Well, good morning and welcome to Kenwick First United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you're able to uh, join us as we gather together, at least in this virtual way, uh, to worship this God who loves us. Uh, this morning, we uh, are welcoming some friends from Manitou United Methodist Church. They're going to be tuning in with us this morning so that we can give uh, the worship team uh, up in Spokane uh, a break this week. And so uh, I'm pleased that you're able to join us this morning as we gather for worship. You know, each week when I uh, come into this empty sanctuary to, uh, to film these sermons, in my mind I uh, think out in the congregation and I think of all the places that I'm used to seeing familiar faces. But now that I know that Manito is joining us this morning, I'm a little schizophrenic this morning because the same place where the, the blocks sit is the place where the Eberleys sit in Spokane or where the Deathridges sit is where the plumbers sit in Spokane. And so uh, I'll try to keep all that straight in my head and hopefully I'll make some sense this morning. But I'm so glad that no matter where you are, you're able to join us today as we gather together and as we worship this God who has reached out beyond time and space to offer us a hand of love and compassion and grace, and we spend this time worshiping that God of love. So friends, welcome to church. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Kennewick First this morning. We're so glad you could join us. We have a great service for you today. When God created the world, he said that it was very good. In our fallen state, things don't often seem that way. Let's find our sense of self, our sense of worth in what God says about us.
Well, you know, over the last 10 months, as we've had to, to gather in this virtual way uh, to worship um, with one another, uh, we've really discovered how important it is for uh, our church to understand that, that we are not just a, a building or a facility that sits on a corner in downtown Kennewick, but that we are truly a community of faith that um, shares our lives together and makes this journey to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that we give you an opportunity to do during this time of worship is to reach out to one another and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Since we can't be sitting next to each other in a sanctuary, what we uh, want to encourage you to do is take just a moment to, to send maybe a text message or, or write an email or if you want to pause the video and make a phone call as a way to just reconnect with those uh, people that are so close to us in this community of faith and just pass the peace of Christ to one another. So friends, take just a moment and reach out to someone and offer the peace of Christ this morning. This morning, we're going to be uh, talking a, a bit about beauty and how um, Scripture speaks to us about beauty. And by way of an opening prayer, I came across a poem by uh, a poet named um, Ardi Chopra. Uh, she lives in India, and she wrote a poem, and I'll have the accreditation and the um, link that you can um, look up her poem and others uh, in the, the closing credits at the end of the service. But I thought that it would be appropriate that we would hear this poem this morning and hear it in um, the spirit of prayer this morning. So friends, as a way of an opening prayer, um, hear this poem on beauty. There's a poem in every flower, a sonnet in every tree, a tale in every lifetime. It's just for you to see. There are lyrics in every brook as it rushes over rocks. There's an ode in every nuance as love's wonder unlocks. There's rhyme in every sound, every beating of a heart. There's poetry in every union and every couple who are apart. And just as there is wonder in every new life that's created, there is sadness and regret for the unsaid and unfettered. Just listen for the music that your ear cannot hear. Just strain yourself for the melody that's so far and yet so near. The wonder of the creator, the magic of the divine is there to feel for all of us to soon be yours and mine. Lord, may we be aware of the beauty that is in us and surrounds us in all places, especially as we worship you this morning. Amen. Well, you know, every week I make a special point of just offering my appreciation and thanks uh, to, to members and friends of Kennewick uh, First United Methodist Church for, for your support of the, the things that we do around here and how we have continued to be a, a church that feels called to uh, help our community love God and uh, to be in ministry loving our neighbors. Uh, thank you so much for, for your generosity and for the, the support of the things that we're doing and of uh, being able to, to help us come up with new ways of uh, finding ways to do outreach and make sure that Bible studies still happen and that youth group still happens and Sunday school still happens and all those things that we uh, feel are so important to this work that God's called us to do. So I, I just want to offer my appreciation and um, uh, my thanks to you for, for the support that we've experienced over these last 10 months. You know, if you would like to continue to support uh, Kennewick First United Methodist Church, uh, one of the ways that you can do that is if you uh, go to our uh, webpage at kennewickfirst.com, uh, up in the right-hand corner, there's a little button that says Give. You can uh, click that button and uh, make a donation through the webpage. If you'd like, you can uh, text uh, one word, Kennewick First, to 77977. You can make a, a donation right from your uh, smartphone if you'd like to do that, or you can do it the old-fashioned way, the way that I do it. You can put a, a check in the mail and mail it to the church. And I, I want to encourage anyone who is watching this, whether you uh, live here in Kennewick or uh, maybe you're uh, worshiping with us from somewhere else, um, I, I just want to encourage you to be in support of your local church 
because I know that churches all over our region are working so hard to uh, continue to be a, a presence that brings about the kingdom of God in the communities that were set. And so I just want to encourage you uh, to be supportive in your finances and in other ways of the churches in which you belong. But friends, thank you so much for the support that you've showed this congregation over the, the last so many months. chapter 1 in Genesis, verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. In 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, we have our second scripture with Peter writing to wives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. The word of the Lord is before us.
Well, again, good morning, friends. I'm so glad that you're able to be uh, with us in this time of worship. And even though we can't be uh, sitting next to one another, um, it is the, the Spirit of God which uh, occupies this space between us and binds us together as a community of faith. So I'm so glad that you're, you're able to join us this morning. So here we are on Valentine's Day here in Kennewick. There's snow on the ground, and we're dealing with all of that. Um, but, you know, I know that Valentine's Day for a lot of us is going to be different than Valentine's Day in the past. You know, typically I would take uh, Jennifer and Adeline out for a nice dinner and um, let them know how much um, I love and appreciate them. I think this year it's probably going to be maybe Thai food, uh, take out Thai food in a, a paper box in the living room, or uh, maybe I'll take the, the batteries out of the smoke detectors and try to cook something nice. I don't know. We'll see. But I'm sure that it's going to be a different Valentine's Day <laughs> than we're used to. You know, uh, as, as, we were, as I was planning on this sermon and knowing that uh, Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday, I thought, well, I'm going to preach about something Valentine's-y, right? And so I thought, well, let's, you know, beauty is a good thing to preach about on Valentine's Day. And so over the last month, as I've been putting sermons together and things like that, I have to admit that what I thought was going to be a relatively easy sermon was um, a bit challenging for me. And there was at least a couple of times where I thought, maybe I'll just punt on this one and we'll, we'll find something else to preach on. But uh, if you know me very well, I, I often think that if, if something's challenging for me, then it's probably challenging for a lot of us, right? And so I decided to go ahead and, and um, kind of follow the, the trails that, that this sermon took me down, and um, I hope that it um, uh, serves as a place to maybe hear God's words uh, as it did for me as I was putting it together. You know, the, the passage that we heard read for us uh, just uh, a, a little while ago by Dean Mitchell, which, by the way, I grew up listening to Dean on the radio, and so it's always great to hear Dean uh, read scripture for us. But, you know, as um, Dean was reading that passage from, from 1 Peter, th that passage that, that Peter writes there is a, a passage that addresses a specific question at a specific time and a specific place, like really all the letters of uh, the New Testament do. But, but like all of those letters, I, I firmly believe that there's, there's truth that's revealed to us in a timeless way. And even though we aren't the recipients of that uh, initial letter and addressing that initial uh, thought that Peter was uh, speaking about, uh, there's truth that's revealed to us some 20 centuries later, right? And and the situation in which Peter is writing that letter, which is kind of our go-to passage for uh, passages in Scripture about beauty, Peter's writing uh, to kind of address uh, a problem that um, is happening within this new fledgling church. Uh, the problem that is happening is that there's become a, a number of women who have come to faith in Jesus and their spouses, their husbands, have not. Now, I'll put a little preface here before I go any further. You, you all have heard me preach uh, a number of times, and I, I hope that you're aware of, of my feelings and uh, my, my sorrow over how many Christian traditions have um, treated women in communities of faith and have oftentimes made them feel as though they are second best or that somehow they are not as important in this kingdom of God. And, and I've preached uh, and, and spoken about that a number of times, so I'm not going to rehash uh, that for you this morning. But I do want you to know that even though, as Peter writes this, he's writing very heavily about the actions that these women should do, uh, I want you to know that um, regardless of who you are, regardless of your gender, regardless of, of any of those things that we often put in categories, we are beloved children of God um, and that God loves uh, all of us dearly and that we all find hope and joy in this gospel of Jesus, right? But as Peter writes this, he's, he's writing specifically to these women who, and, and as he writes to them, he's, he's talking to them about um, this idea of, of kind of displaying the beauty that has come about in their lives because of this faith that they've found in Jesus. And it's so easy for us to kind of flip the tables on that and, and put it into kind of a checklist of here's the things to do to make your man happy. And I don't think that that's what Peter is talking about at all. I think what Peter is talking about is, is uh, being able to, to, in a way, express the, the change and the transformation and the beauty that has come about in their lives um, that they would be on display not only for their spouses, but for all of us to see. 
Uh, it seems uh, a little unfair that as Peter writes this passage, there's uh, a good seven or eight verses uh, addressing wives in those relationships and only one verse that addresses husbands. And that one verse basically boils down to husbands, don't be jerks to your wife. What, what I would have loved to have seen is Peter say, uh, by the way, all the things that I just told your wife, you should do those things also. And by the way, don't be a jerk, right? But, but we, don't, uh, we don't get that in this passage. But, you know, this passage uh, speaks to us about beauty. And to be honest, beauty is kind of a, a difficult thing to, to get a, a grip on. About 15 years ago, when I was living in Vancouver, Washington, I took a course over at George Fox Seminary on uh, spiritual formation. And uh, the instructor who was teaching that, that class, kind of in just uh, almost a throwaway statement as part of his lecture, was telling the story about a monastery in which um, he had gone and visited. And, and one of the things that they did in this monastery at the end of each year was the, the monks in the monastery would meet with the head of their order and answer a couple of questions as a way to kind of evaluate how their spiritual lives were going. And one of the questions that uh, they had to answer was, how have they brought about beauty in the world? And, you know, that, that course was a three-week course, but in reality, it could have been about a 20-minute course because the, the thing that I took away from that class was exactly that phrase. Some 15 years later, I still wrestle with that question and ask that question of myself. How have I brought about beauty in the world? And, and like I said, beauty is a hard thing to get a grip on because beauty is incredibly subjective, right? I mean, it has to do with our context for sure, you know, in, in the passages that there's over 50 of them in, in Scripture that deal with this idea of, of beauty, beauty in Scripture is described in such a different way than beauty in our culture and our society is described. And I want to look at those um, places where there's some similarity and also places where there's quite a divergent idea of what beauty is. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to think about what is a definition of beauty? I did lots of research to see if there was a definition of, of beauty that would be satisfactory, I guess, for me. And boy, there are all kinds of definitions of beauty. But, but most of the definitions that I, I saw revolved around the idea of appearance, right? And none of those really seemed to, to satisfy me until I came to one definition that I thought kind of hit the nail on the head for me, and especially in terms of the way scripture speaks about beauty. Um, see, beauty is, is, according to this definition, it says, beauty is that which brings delight to beholder. Beauty is that which brings delight to the beholder. I, I like that definition because it doesn't revolve merely around appearance or the things that we see. Uh, there's something different going on. You know, each, each Christmas we sing that, that hymn, there's a song in the air, right? And the, the words of that song says, there's a song in the air, there's a star in the sky, there's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry, and the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing, for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. I mean, that, that hymn is, is talking about this story of Jesus being born and tells us the story of this poor family who's literally living in a barn and these shepherds who, who come from the fields after hearing this wondrous news who spend all day in the wilderness with sheep. They're certainly not what our culture would describe as beautiful, but in this hymn it says the beautiful sing. There's something different about beauty than just our appearance, right? I mean, beauty is not just merely something that we show outwardly. It's not just whether or not we have a, a nice suit or a good haircut or a good pair of shoes or, or any of those things. I mean, it, it's certainly subjective, but I like that definition that beauty comes from somewhere else, not even in an appearance way of thinking about it, but it's something that evokes a reaction in us, something that brings about delight when we behold it, Right? I mean, if I were to say uh, to Jennifer on this Valentine's Day, Jennifer's my wife, if I were to say, 
You know, Jennifer, you are as beautiful as a 1990s Ducati SS with a, an oil-cooled V-twin engine that has 105 horsepower, and the, the suspension is set up on rails so that, that when I lean into a turn, it is rock solid. You are as beautiful as that Ducati. Now, in general, it's not a good idea to compare your spouse to uh, motorcycle parts. But in the context, I mean, Jennifer knows me pretty well, and she knows the work that I have done on that Ducati that is in my garage to get it to that place. And, and so in the context, that's a pretty high compliment. Um, and it, it talks about the, the delight or the, the, the feelings that, uh, that are um, evoked in me as I see or experience something, right? And so there is some kind of a, a suggestion of... Um, a subjective way of understanding beauty. And I like that definition that beauty is that which brings delight to, be, to the beholder. You know, if beauty is something that generates an emotion or a response from us, you know, it's not just merely physical appearance. It's not just a haircut or a suit. It's not just shoes or, or the right belt that matches your other accessories, right? It's, it's something that, that comes from someplace very different. You know, and, and we also know that, that if something doesn't evoke that kind of response and delight, if something is devoid of that beauty, you know, it's easy for us to feel as though either it is ugly or sometimes can even evoke emotion in us that makes us feel ugly. Um, years and years ago, I used to write for... Um, uh, a United Methodist Publishing House uh, magazine for Christian youth. And I was amazed. I mean, this was, golly, 25 years ago when I wrote for this magazine. And even 25 years ago, I, I was amazed to find out that every image that was put in that magazine each month was edited in some way to make the images more beautiful. Every single one of them. And it brings to mind this idea that the images that we see that define beauty for us, most of them that we see, at least in advertising or in our culture around us, they aren't even real. I mean, there's a whole thing, there's a, there's a whole other sermon in the idea that, that those images in a youth ministry magazine were edited in such a way to make people more beautiful, and there was a whole kind of underlying idea that, that you wanted to have beautiful people in your youth ministries or in your youth group, and like I said, that's a whole other sermon, and we only got 20 minutes this morning. But, but this idea that, that the images that, that we see that are supposedly to be enhanced to make them more beautiful, in fact, in reality do quite the opposite. I mean, as we look in, in magazines, and especially for, for women who, who deal with these uh, identity issues around beauty, and we see photoshopped images of what beauty is, and they're not even real, rather than invoking an emotion of delight, they do the exact opposite. I mean, often they bring about emotions of inadequacy or, or failure or, or not being able to measure up to those standards that we say are beauty and, in fact, the things that have been enhanced that are supposed to be beautiful, in fact, do quite the opposite and they make us feel ugly. I mean, that's not the beauty that Scripture talks about. In fact, I don't think that's beauty at all. I mean, beauty is something that evokes delight in us and devote and evokes uh, an, an emotional response in us. And, and we can not only look at something and say it's beauty, beautiful, or, or we can experience things that are beautiful like we do in a song or in, a, uh, in an experience that we've had. But when that is devoid and that experience is gone, it's easy to understand them as being ugly. You know, I, like many of you over the last few months, have tried to limit my exposure to, to social media. And uh, as I hear from friends who are doing the same thing, the phrase that I hear over and over and over again is that they've decided to abstain from social media because social media has become so ugly. Now, when they say that phrase, they're not saying that 
the, the screen on their computer isn't pleasing, that they don't like the colors of the, the format or the, where the pictures are placed or, or the font that is used in the, uh, the social media that they use. What they're saying is that the emotion that is evoked from them is anything but delight. And the idea is that if that's not what the emotion is or if that's not the experience we have, then our first reaction is to feel as though it's ugly. And it's easy to, to fall in that trap when we define beauty as something other than the way that we evoke a response to something. You know, every... Um, uh, well, let me back up just a little bit. You know, Peter tells us in this passage of Scripture that we just heard read for us, that beauty doesn't come from the things that we wear, but that it comes from a spirit that is the delight of God. I mean, that's the idea of beauty that we find in Scripture. That it's not just a, 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 an appearance thing, but that it's a quality of our heart and, and what our lives are devoted to that bring about a transformation in the world that brings delight, right? Right? And things that are beautiful evoke a very strong response, at least they do in me. You know, every place I've lived, one of the first things that I, I usually do is I, I find a spot that I use as my prayer spot. Uh, it's usually uh, some place where I can, in the morning, sit in my car and spend some time in prayer and kind of think about my day as it's coming up. Uh, here in Kennewick, my, I have a, a spot that I discovered when I moved back home. Uh, it's a, a place that overlooks the river, and it's a, a great spot. The, the geese and the ducks swim there in the river, and the, the seagulls come up to my car because they think they're going to get french fries. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. In, in Spokane, the spot that I, I had that uh, was a, a beautiful spot, it's up on High Drive, looks out over the valley, and you know, on days that there was fog, it, it's right at the level where the fog would stop right at the top of that valley, and it'd be like looking out over uh, a, a lake of clouds, right? And there were bald eagles that would perch in the trees up there, and it was a, a beautiful spot. And I would uh, park there in the mornings, every morning, and I would spend uh, 45 minutes to an hour um, praying each day as I um, started my day and uh, just kind of reconnecting with God as I started my day. And it was a beautiful spot until... Until one day, as I would drive into that parking spot every, every morning, um, every now and again, there would be a, a car that was parked there. And for uh, people who found themselves living on the streets or living on their car, um, it was a spot where they would often park their cars to sleep. And so this car had been there uh, a couple of days. And usually when I would pull up and park uh, the, the people or the gentleman who was living in that car would kind of get himself together and start the car and he would drive off. And after a, a couple of days, I pulled into that spot and uh, the car was parked there and looked as though he was still sleeping. And so he was still sleeping in his car and I spent my time there in prayer and drove off. And the next day I pulled up and the, the car was there and it looked as though he was still sleeping in the, the car. And I I drove off, and there had been a windstorm that night, and so there was a bunch of leaves and branches and things that were kind of laying on the ground, and it became obvious that that car hadn't moved. And as I pulled in, uh, there was a, a gentleman who was jogging, and he was looking in the, the car window. And I got out of my car, because obviously something seemed wrong, and my stomach just sank. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I, th I think there's something wrong with this guy in the car. And so we banged on the windows, and we couldn't get him to wake up. And the car was locked, and we couldn't open the door. And so we quickly called 911, and the, the police showed up in just a, a few moments. And an ambulance and a fire truck showed up, and they were able to get the door, the door open. And when they opened the door, uh, they found that there was a pistol on the seat next to him and that um, this gentleman had committed suicide sometime within the, the three days that I had seen that car parked up there. It became an ugly place in an instant. What was so beautiful became ugly. It took me a month before I could go back to that spot. And after I did finally go back to that spot, that place became different for me because I had some of the best genuine conversations with God 
about my situation and about the situation of others, about what it meant to be part of the, the kingdom of God and to share hope and joy with the world and to know that there was someone who was suffering under such loneliness and such stress that he thought um, a pistol to the side of his head was the best option. And after a while, that spot became beautiful again. Not because of the scene that had unfolded there, but because it became a place where I had some of the best and deepest and most heartfelt conversations with God. It's still a, a sacred place for me. It's still a, a place of beauty. When I go back to Spokane, I always stop by and um, stop at that spot and just offer a, a prayer and ask for peace in the midst of, of the world that we are at. I mean, beauty is something that's subjective. And, and beauty in scripture is, is something that evokes delight in us. And although I wouldn't say that that delight is something that's happy and something that I want to jump, uh, jump up and down about, it is still a place of beauty because it represents a connection and a conversation and a willingness of a God who loves me to have honest and deep conversations with me. And it's beautiful. So how do we become beautiful? I mean, in, in Scripture, if the idea of beauty that the world shows us is, is these photoshopped images and these images that do anything but give us a sense of delight, what is it that makes us beautiful, at least as Scripture talks about it? Peter tells us that beauty doesn't come from the things that we wear or the things that we do, but, but beauty comes from a spirit that is a delight to God. So what do we do as individuals and what do we do as a church to become beautiful? I mean, I believe that what Scripture tells us is that beauty at its heart comes from a spirit and a life that reflects the compassion and the justice and the grace of God. And I fear that all too often the world around us doesn't have an emotion of delight when they come into connection with the church as they see it or as it's portrayed. You know, I think our baptism vows are a mechanism that leads us to that kind of beauty that Scripture speaks about. I mean, think about it for a moment. When we oppose evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, that's beautiful. When we proclaim that Jesus saves us from sin, that Jesus breaks down all the barriers that keep us from experiencing the love of God and allows us to love one another, friends, that's beautiful. When we surround one another in a community of love and support, and not just within the walls of this church, but when we do that for the communities in which we live, that's beautiful. I mean, these are genuine images, genuine experiences of the beauty that God speaks about in these di divinely inspired words of Scripture. They aren't photoshopped images. They aren't unrealistic standards. They aren't things that cause us to feel as though we are inadequate or somehow we aren't enough. But as Peter says, they flow from a spirit that is a delight of God. I want to finish with this. In the letter to Ephesians in chapter 2, these are the words that we read. For it, is grace, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not by works so that anyone can boast. For we are God's, and as he uses this phrase, a poinuma, which is a Greek word that doesn't just mean handiwork, but it means masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, that's what beauty is about. Hear this, we are God's masterpiece and we have been called to bring about an emotion that brings delight in the world rather than fear or grief or wrath. I mean, the beauty that God speaks about in Scripture comes from a spirit that is humble and reflects the very presence of God who brings us joy and life and grace and beauty. Church, we are created for beauty. 
And if you haven't heard this, I want you to hear this today. Friends who are the church. You, and I say this about you, all of us, the church, not this building or not the stained glasses or, or, or not the things that seem so appealing to the eye, but you, church, are beautiful. And you've been called to that beauty. Happy Valentine's Day, friends. One of the most beautiful things to God is a life yielded totally to him. Let's make it our prayer to live that kind of life and give all the glory to him. So friends, hear this benediction this morning. Go from here celebrating that we serve a God who loves us. Go from here living a life of beauty that evokes delight in all who experience it. Go from here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen.